This is Kyle Cleveland. I'm with Temple University Japan's Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. This webinar has been in production for quite some time. And really, I'd, I'd like to thank Magali Safadi Larson, who was a professor of sociology emerit at Temple University. Magali, it's really through her connections that we've brought this together. And through Magali's influence, we've brought in Lori Menite, who's the associate professor of public policy at Rutgers University. Lori is an expert on voting issues. She's published two books on the subject, The Myth of Voter Fraud and Keeping Down the Black Vote, Race and the Demobilization of American Voters, which was co-authored with another one of our panelists, Francis Fox Piven. Lori has been doing very um, focused work on this for an extended period of time. Uh, Francis Fox Piven is a distinguished professor of political science and a sociology emerit at the Senior University of New York. She is the author of some classics books, Regulating the Poor, the Functions of Public Welfare, Poor People's Movements, Why They Succeed and Why They Fell, Why Americans Don't Vote, and Who's Afraid of Francis Fox Piven. She's the former president of the American Sociological Society, the Society for the Study of Social Problems, and is a former vice president of the American Political Science Association. Sarah Jean Rosito is an instructor and independent consultant at Temple University's Japan campus. Temple University, of course, in Philadelphia is our main campus, and TUJ has been in Japan with this campus um, for some 30 years. For a number of years, uh, Sarah, has, Sarah Jean has taught courses and done work on nonprofit NGOs. Um, she conducts workshops. She's been involved with um, NGOs working on the Fukushima Toho disasters of 2011. Uh, she also works with U.S. organizations, has worked at uh, Sophia University. She's an advisor to Japanese organizations such as the Asian Rural Institute and is uh, active also in voter registration in Japan. So if we could get started, I, I think, uh, Magali, I'll hand it over to you. And well, thank you for I shall us. rapidly hand it over to Sarah Jean speak here and uh, it's good to see some family and friends here. Um, good evening or good early morning from Shizuoka, Japan. Uh, I'd like to talk for about five minutes about US elections of voters overseas and then talk a little bit about our view from overseas for about five minutes. So just a little bit of basic information, you know, there's about 9 million of us people who live overseas, which is and about half, we're not exactly sure how many are actually eligible voters, which is more than 35 to 40 states in the US, depending on which data you look at. <laughs> and um, we're from all 50 states in all congressional districts and in most of the territories as well in the US. Um, by and large, however, um, a very small number of people do vote regularly. Um, we're of all different age groups. The people who do vote tend to be people with a graduate or professional degree and are working people. Um, there are a number of people who are retired, but those people tend to be more in um, the West, in Europe, not so much in Asia. In Asia, we have a younger population. I would be old in the Asian population, young in the European Americans abroad population. Um, one of the, of course, key constituencies of overseas Americans are uh, military um, families, not only people in the military, but their families with them. Uh, but something to tell you about our, our turnout, it's incredibly low, this 7% in 2016, 4% 2018. Um, so it is quite low. And the major reason, this may come as no surprise to anybody um, in the States who's familiar with the barriers. The major reason people do not vote is what people feel are barriers or the difficulty in figuring out the systems. It's not only every state, but different counties within states have different guidelines for voters overseas. Um, many states, 18 states, still require everything to be done by regular snail mail um, and most states require you register every single year and the system, people get bogged down in this system. Um, we have an increasing number of people who were 
who were born overseas or haven't really lived in the United States long enough to have an, an address that'll be accepted in the state that would be their legal domicile, that's a major challenge for younger people in particular. This year, a key issue Americans faced was the mail issue. Many states, um, uh, it would take months to get our ballots to many states. And in the past, many states would not allow express mail services. A positive, let me talk a little bit about a positive with this year. Um, some states extended the receipt time. Um, for example, I'm from New York State. The usual receipt time would have been the 12th. This year, it would be November 16th, next Monday. Um, I think another positive thing was all the media attention given to absentee and mail-in voting and the issues with the US Postal Service that actually piqued people's interest in doing things in advance. Uh, and I would say another, <laughs> I've got to find some positive things out here, <laughs> is that some of the express mail barriers were removed because of COVID-19 and the delay. But based on our experience in the past, and I do want to uh, you know, say full disclosure here, since 2004, I've been an active member of Democrats Abroad, which is part of the Democratic Party. Uh, Republicans overseas is a PAC, it's a little bit different. Uh, Democrats Abroad this year uh, made an active push with a target of getting at least 1 million votes, which would be quite a big increase compared to the past. Um, and we had about 1,500 volunteers make uh, calls to 600,000 people, voters overseas, and there were about 18,000 people mobilized this year. So if we see the difference compared to the past, of course, in general, more Americans voted by mail. But when we look at the numbers of uh, Americans overseas, it's about double downloaded their ballot. We're not exactly sure about the final numbers because remember many states today and then Monday would be the last day to receive them. Um, the ratio that's military, a third to two thirds, depending on the state, depending on the data you look at. Um, the issue is getting your ballot doesn't mean it's counted because of all the different issues we face. Let me give like a few examples of why we were so excited this year in thinking about how we might play a bigger role. I think we felt as voters overseas, um, we know the vote was gonna be very close. Maybe some of us are not as optimistic as people in the state, some people back in the mainland who thought there was gonna be a blowout. Um, and we knew that going from say 600,000 votes to over a million votes, to 1.2, 1.5 million votes could actually make a difference in the number of key districts. When we look at some of the battleground states like North Carolina, Georgia, Nevada, we know that in 2016, in some of these counties, there were thousands or even just hundreds of votes that came in from overseas, sometimes half of them military people, um, such as Georgia, about half of the overseas votes were people in the military. Nevada, a bit less, North Carolina, about half. And we knew that our votes would make a difference. Um, however, I think that what we have been facing after getting our ballots in, um, although the numbers are still out, uh, we'll find that out probably in a month or so, is where do we fit in this whole mess of what we see in the news today? Um, how do we fit into what's going on in American society, not just with the election, but with Black Lives Matter, with the Me Too movement, with the civil unrest going around on? And how do we explain these things to people? Uh, one of the biggest, and I'll tell you a few of the questions I get, and I'm not going to answer them, uh, but one of some of the big questions we get, now, if these politicians in the US were actually elected by that system, how can they question that system that puts them in place? Another question would be getting, well, if the US exported this electoral democracy system abroad, why does it work better in other places from registration to getting people to vote, such as a place like Japan? Another question that I've been getting is, 
well, gee, if it doesn't work in the US, why should it work anywhere else? And I've had these discussions with people a lot. And I think that over the past four years, many of us felt it was, you know, kind of, we wish we had a Canadian flag in our bags when we travel. Um, those of us who have spent most of our lives overseas, um, during the Obama years, we were quite, people were quite excited to see us being Americans. The last four years hasn't felt quite that way. Um, but talking to people about this election process has been quite interesting because it's given us the opportunity to talk about these questions from pe with different people from different countries who really question um, US position in the world. And I think for those of us who live overseas, we've been questioning this a long time and what it means to be American and what do these votes say? And what does this disruption say of people protesting against the elections? What does this say about our system? And I think this makes a lot of us think about, well, what's our place as well in the future of redeveloping this, these structures? What's our position? How can we contribute to this redevelopment? Um, I think some of us overseas don't see the US as the world leader anymore. I actually haven't for a very long time, but I'll leave that off of this, off of this discussion point. But the, I would say the biggest thing that disturbs me as I wrap up here is how this undermines belief in the country, the system, and really delegitimizes everyone in positions of power. And that's something I'm sad about, but at the same time, I see it as an opportunity for us to come together and rebuild. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah Jean. I think that I would pass it uh, to Lorraine Minichi, our expert on votes, voting voter fraud, so-called voter fraud and voter suppression. So Lorraine, it's up to you. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, discussion. Um, you know, going in, excuse me, going into the election, um, as you probably all know, the polling was showing um, Biden ahead eight, 10 percentage points for the last year. Um, he was consistently polling above Trump 50% um, since May. And of course the election was a lot closer. So what I thought I would uh, talk about or touch on is um, what happened in a sort of uh, uh, direct way, what happened, who voted, um, what, is, what was the turnout like? And then turn to uh, discuss for a few minutes um, a trend that we've been seeing really over the last 20 years, which is the increasing engagement of the judiciary and the use of the courts to affect um, uh, elections and, and you know, election outcomes. So just a kind of quick overview, um, what, what happened? Why was, it, why was it so close? So the polling community, if you will, are having that discussion again, like they did in 2016, when the, and the polls underestimated um, Donald Trump's support. Um, but in general, uh, Trump held together the, the sort of co uh, composition of his base um, in this election, and he actually expanded it a little bit. I mean, the number of people who voted for Donald Trump has increased by maybe 9 million over 20, 2016. And it's not due just to the growth of the population because some of the, there were some shifts within that coalition. But in general, the, the composition of uh, the electorate that voted for Trump in 2016 held. So, so Trump um, got, um, for example, obviously the white vote. Um, voters over age 50 slightly favored Trump. All other age groups below 50 favored Biden. And interestingly, the group that most strongly supported Biden were the 18 to 24 year olds, 65%. Um, and I'm using here exit polls, uh, the traditional exit polls that are done. And I've just said, you know, caveat, we don't know if how accurate these polls really are any uh, anymore, but this is what we have at the moment. There'll be post-election um, analysis uh, over the next year that will fill this in better. Um, 
So I mentioned whites. Um, whites uh, favored Trump, 58% of white voters compared to 87% of black voters, 65% of Latinos, 61% of Asian Americans. Now, that is a kind of typical composition of the partisan breakdown nationally um, by, by race. Trump held the South. He actually, if you look at the vote, not at the states, how the states voted, he also held the Midwest. Biden was uh, stronger in the East Coast and, and the West. Trump um, was the candidate for men, 53%, compared to 57% of women who voted for Biden. Um, on issues and sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the classic uh, issues defining the Republican Party over the last 40 years, 50 years, pro-life, people who were identify themselves as pro-life, uh, 76%, um, evangelical Christians, 76%, despite everything, um, favored, favored Trump. Um, in terms of the education issue, it's interesting because much has been made of Trump's appeal among those voters who lack college education, high school or, or lower, and lack a college education. And again, Trump won, 60, uh, won, won that group, 67%, but he won it really on the strength of, of whites because voters of color without a college degree favored Biden. So it's a story of both race, education as this kind of crude proxy for class in the United States. Um, Biden clearly benefited, I wanna make this point, from the, all the anti-Trump energy, the pro-democracy energy of the movements of the summer and beyond, the protest movements of the last several years. And, and how did we get a glimpse of this? Um, first of all, two thirds of all first time voters voted for Biden. So that's a new, you know, new people coming into the uh, electorate um, and not just simply randomly, um, you know, appears to be coming in, being pulled in um, by either the threat of, of Trump or the appeal of Biden. 57% um, of voters said they had a favorable opinion of the Black Lives Matter movement. Of that group, that 57% of voters, 78% voted for, for Biden. 53% um, of voters said that the country's criminal justice system treats Black people unfairly. And of that group, 82% uh, voted for Biden. Um, so we have some glimpses here in some of this data around, especially around race, um, but probably the overwhelming issue in this election was the coronavirus and the, the response of the Trump administration to that. Um, you again see clear divisions uh, in terms of voters um, who believe coronavirus is out of control, who think the federal government's response has been unacceptable. Um, you see that partisanship with those people voting for Biden and um, a stark difference with, with those voting for, for Trump. So that's kind of a, a picture of, of the electorate. I will say that the turnout, you may have been reading about this, the overall turnout uh, is the highest it's been in 120 years. Uh, probably going to be 160 million Americans. Those overseas ballots haven't all been counted yet. Some of the provisional ballots haven't been counted yet that can make as uh, Sarah Jean mentioned, you know, they, they need to be counted and they can make a difference um, in terms of the, the, uh, the shift, in, but, but probably not in this election, um, that I don't think we're gonna see a shift from where we are right now, which is with Biden um, likely to get 306 electoral college votes. Um, but nevertheless, um, those votes need to be counted and they're coming, they're coming in at this rate now. Um, let me turn to the issue of, that I mentioned of the role of the courts. And this is um, so, somewhat disturbing, I would say, um, because since the disputed election of 2000, every presidential election, every federal election since then, but especially the presidential elections, we've seen an increase in the amount of litigation, both before, mostly before, um, the election. So in this round, there have been over 400 lawsuits 
um, that have challenged rules. And in some cases, um, this has been rules to make it easier to vote, but in others, it's a, a sort of defensive uh, move, move. And again, the partisan divide is, is very clear. The Democrats everywhere have um, either gone into court or tried to defend rules that make it easier for people to vote, that loosen up some of the requirements around deadlines, for example. And I will say that that's one thing, uh, I think we'll have a larger discussion about what was surprising, but one thing that was a little surprising is the aggressiveness on the part of the uh, Democratic Party groups, uh, very aggressive before the election to go into court in, in the wake of this pandemic, in, in even before with the primary elections in the earlier you know, several months ago, going into court to try to uh, win favorable uh, rules for counting mail ballots, knowing that the shift to mail balloting was happening. Um, but uh, why, why is it, you know, a little concerning? Well, of course, the first reason is that the judiciary should not be picking the president, number one. Um, but, you know, when you think about it, look at the composition of the Supreme Court and how many of those justices are on the court uh, because they were appointed by a president who did not win the majority of votes. And that's George W. Bush and Donald Trump. Um, we have, we, what we saw of the Supreme Court's role in shaping electro electoral rules uh, was, was not encouraging. Um, they, were not, they were not particularly pro-voter in the, in the few uh, instances where they, where they weighed in. And that does not bode well uh, for the future. Um, we know that the Trump administration has appointed you know, almost a record number of uh, just judges that have been vetted by the Federalist Society for their views on other issues. I'm not always clear where those judges are with respect to voting rights, but the presumption is that they are not terribly friendly toward, uh, toward, toward voting rights. So this is, this is concerning because the courts, you know, obviously these are the institution of the judiciary is one in which the judges have uh, lifetime tenure. They're fairly young, the Trump appointed judges, um, and they may be weighing in later on, on rules that make it uh, more difficult for people uh, to vote. So I think I'll stop there, but um, I think we'll get into this a bit more. I will say the one last point about the, the court cases. So we're, you know, there were there was a lot of litigation before the election, and in and in most cases, it 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 went a little bit better for voters than not. Um, we're in the post-election phase. It's sort of dif different issues are being raised. Uh, I don't think that there's any chance that um, the courts are going to make the decision for us in this election. I think the Trump campaigns, uh, court cases in some, ca in some cases are literally being laughed out of court for how poorly they are uh, constructed for their you know, failure to provide evidence of the claims they're making about potential election rigging, uh, you know, about whether um, you know, observers were allowed to observe, about whether signature matching rules were strict enough. Those are the kinds of claims. They are now admitting that despite all of the propaganda about voter fraud, that none of these cases have anything to do with fraud committed by voters where there's any evidence whatsoever that they're able to bring. They're now admitting that these cases aren't even about that. So, um, and I think there's just a story about an hour ago in the New York Times about the law firm representing the Trump campaign um, in Pennsylvania pulling out because uh, there's, you know, these are not good lawsuits and for the most part, they're, they're not, um, uh, as I say, they're not sort of legitimately put together in a good way in which the court is recognizing the claims or even adjudicating them. So I, 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 would, I don't think that is a, a, is a concern, but the amount of litigation uh, overall is a little concerning. And um, I think with that, I'll, I'll stop and turn it back to Magali. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce Francis Fox Piven, who needs no introduction ever. 
just let me take this minute to say how much we admire her. She has been a guiding light and an inspiration for all of us who thought we were, you know, progressive social scientists. So it is my pleasure to introduce Francis Fox Piven, the author of so many important books and such a fantastic teacher and friend. I'm not sure that I was surprised by anything about the election. I was much more surprised by some of the Republican tactics leading up to the election. Like for example, the dismantling of the post office. Uh, I mean, a lot of this seemed to me, you know, I grew up, I was trained uh, by political scientists who took for granted the norms which limit what political actors can do in American politics. And that really shaped how we, my generation and generations that followed me were taught about how politics works. There's certain kinds of things that no one would do, but there were a lot of things that the Trump team would do. And that was a source of constant repeated surprise. And I bet it was a source of surprise for my fellow panelists as well. But the results of the election, no. The results seem to me to be a kind of outcome compounded of the, of, of the widespread outrage at what the Trump administration was doing, their failure especially to master, to get control of the coronavirus, uh, compounded of the outrage on the one hand and the vote suppression tactics that were pulled into play on the other hand. So the Democrats won, but they didn't win. There was no blue wave that we hoped for and that we expected. So, but to get back, to get to the questions that we really all are urgently preoccupied by, what's gonna happen now? What accounts for this ambiguous electoral result? Uh, I want to suggest that we should think about the Democratic Party. We've been thinking and talking a lot about the Republican Party, about the Trumpites, uh, about Mitch McConnell especially, they're all pretty awful and <laughs> sort of like a horror show or a clown show or both. A clown show superimposed on a horror show. But a very important component of our problem, our crisis today is the failure of the Democratic Party to perform as what we sort of thought it had become. We sort of thought it had become a kind of labor party, a centrist labor party. And you know, it failed as a centrist labor party. So I think we have to understand why that was true, because maybe in going forward, we wanna to try to reconstruct the Democratic Party and make it into more of a labor party, an authentic labor party. And to understand what happened to the Democratic Party, I think you have to look at two deep underlying conflicts that always shape American politics from the very beginning. One conflict has to do with, it's the conflict of created by democracy, the conflict created by people rising up and demanding a say in government. And that is the conflict between property and voters. It's a very important conflict. It accounts for why we have in the United States still today, a system of electoral representation, which gives every state two senators which, and that in turn, that formula is part of the formula which gives us the electoral college and the presidency. And what is that? That is a formula which values 
land holding, which was the primary form of property at the time that the formula was developed. It gives land holding a kind of a step ahead of, on the ladder, a step ahead of personhood, a step ahead of the right to vote. So, and, and that formula it influences not only the Senate, which has blocked all legislation that would deal with the coronavirus, for example, or that would deal with the economic downturn caused by the pandemic, Block, blocked by the Senate. What's the Senate? The Senate is a, is a body, a decision-making body, which privileges land over people. And that, or think about the courts, which are so important now because they have been stacked by uh, the Republican party. Well, the, wh why do the courts have so much authority in American politics? Why do they have the legal ability to strike down legislation? Why were the courts able throughout the 19th century to prevent the development of labor unions and to block the utilization of the strike weapon by working people? Well, the courts are there because the grand old men who are the founders, originalism is a sin. It is not a principle that we should uphold in trying to build a contemporary democracy. The, the founders were looking for ways to protect property in the face of the threat of dem democracy, because democracy is probably the idea that all people should participate in state decisions is probably the most dramatic and compelling idea in the modern era. It is such an, an, a, an idea that brings passion and uh, endurance and religion to all people. Tremendous sacrifices in the name of democracy and for good reason, because democracy should mean that ordinary people control the, the vast power and majesty of the state. But it's not exactly what it means in the United States, no matter that the United States always applauds itself as being the first democratic nation. It is not what it means in the United States. And that's because we, the founders twisted representation and they in, in, introduced the courts as a co-equal branch of government. So one conflict, deep conflict that dominates contemporary politics is the conflict between property and people. The other conflict that dominates American politics is a conflict over section and race. Now that conflict was apparent from the very beginning of the American Republic. The founders were primarily Southern gentlemen with vast plantations and vast holdings of slaves. And they were determined to protect the influence of their section, which was dominated by a plantation economy and a slave economy. And they did that by pro the provisions which uh, gave land more representation than people. And they did it with arrangements like the arrangement for the Supreme Court. And they later did it by reinterpreting the 14th Amendment, which was actually a great victory of the Civil War. They reinterpreted the 14th Amendment as a protection for corporations and corporate money. And they did it also with the nonsense doctrine, which has dominated law, the legal profession and its contribution to arguments about American politics, the doctrine 
of originalism. What could be sillier than a doctrine that says that we have to go back to what the founders thought when they made decisions hundreds of years ago to understand what those decisions really mean? That is nonsense. And yet we, we applaud it. We respect it. So, but that is a doctrine which was designed to protect the Southern section. The Southern section and its racist ideology and practices. And look at what that section has done to the development of the world's first democracy. That section and its agents in Washington has have they have blocked they throughout the 19th century they blocked the development of labor as an organized force in american politics that section has in the 20th century blocked the civil rights victories the enactment of the civil rights victories of the 1950s and 1960s that section now is threatening to become the dominant force in American politics today in the 21st century. So we have, we have problems in the United States and those problems have as much to do with the, what we call the left, the Democratic Party. And it's the way in which it has been molded by the need to protect property over voters and by the need to protect the Southern section, which is where the Democratic Party flourished as leading up to the Civil War and after the Civil War. So we have to, in a sense, look inward because I bet you're all Democrats, aren't you? Yeah, sure. Our audience is probably a democratic audience, but as Democrats, we should all be so happy that about the stirrings that are occurring on the grassroots level to try to transform the Democratic Party, to try to liberate the Democratic Party from its the constraining influences of property and section. So maybe it will get better. We have to hope it will, because if it doesn't get better, if we don't have a voice in government, we don't have a future. It's very hard to say anything after this. Uh, I think that perhaps I could uh, place certain things on the table for discussion. One is this incredible look towards the past of a country that pretends to be modern and that is sort of modern despite itself. If you, it, I kept thinking about the words of a man I worked with in France, a very known sociologist called Alain Touraine. And he explained uh, his own surprise coming to the United States um, after the Second World War and seeing, uh, going to Harvard and seeing this incredible domination of a British copy. And he told them, well, we in Europe are looking towards the future because the past has been destroyed, but you're looking towards the past and an English past as that. And I must say that as a foreigner, originally it always struck me that this country was so much looking towards England and towards uh, what uh, Huntington called the Tudor form of government. Now, um, I think that apart from what Francis did so, so well, bringing back the past that is at the core of American institutions, we were not really able to, to mark an evolution of those institutions except uh, by the movement of protest of which the most notable and the most persistent in is the protest uh, of African-American people. Um, their, movement towards civil rights and towards the vote and towards social justice has always marked any evolution that we could have in this country. 
And it is still the case that in this very fraud election, those who came forward and voted more than usual and voted 93% for Biden in my city uh, were blacks. So uh, I think that it's difficult for me to respond. I respond to this um, <clears throat> domination of the courts uh, by saying only politics can respond to the courts. On the other hand, the courts have been allowing the repression of politics. But uh, uh, maybe we can open it for discussion because Francis put it as a problem of the United States but that conflict between what the ruling class, which is a capitalist class in most uh, representative democracies, is going to do when it faces the franchise, in fact, marked all the rich countries during the 19th century. And in some, it has been resolved, but in the United States, it certainly has not. So that's a, all I have to say is that we live in a country that is only apparently modern, not very modern. If you compare its technology and its infrastructure to that of Japan and China, you'll be surprised. <laughs> but um, certainly not modern in its way of thinking politics. And uh, what is, and I agree, of course, uh, with the reform of the Democratic Party. But a last point that I would like to bring up for discussion is that I am struck by the place that rhetoric has gained in American politics evermore. It is rhetoric, though not necessarily solid thinking, but rhetoric is marking politics and is pushing things forward. And it's not, uh, it's rhetoric that is spread by the social media um, in all its forms. And it's not necessarily a form of thinking or politics or organizing action and it's damaging. And uh, maybe we could talk about that. I could give examples. I think, um, well, I'll give you an example and it's going to be controversial. I think that the slogan adopted by uh, young people in the protests that were um, around Black Lives Matter is not, um, the slogan of defunding the police is not immediately explanatory and it's extremely resisted in um, <clears throat> working class communities of any color especially in Philadelphia, considering uh, the violence that segregated African-American communities are suffering because of the presence of guns. Uh, it, I can assure you that it's not a popular slogan, that it, the idea of turning towards community police could be popular um, is another issue, but the rhetoric in itself has been uh, not helpful. And so that's an example that you know I was giving because uh, we see that it does not involve uh, people who uh, are very serious about their political participation, as Francis pointed out. I will open it to questions, but my own question was to Mark, if you want, how do you all think that we can move forward uh, in the reform of the Democratic Party and in the reform of voting rights, if we do not obtain control of the Senate? That would be my question, essentially. Well, you can turn that question on its head and say, we can't control, gain control of the Senate unless we reform the Democratic Party. Explain that because, you know, we are now talking about the runoffs, I don't know if the people who hear us all know that we, the Senate is still not under Republican control and it depends of two seats open in Georgia, uh, which are going to a runoff on January 5th. And of course we are all going to try to take them. But uh, I don't know how reforming the Democratic Party can modify the fact that you have, I made a, an addition uh, five states, um, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and the two Dakotas, all together have 4.98 million, which is less than Brooklyn and Queens in terms of population. And they have 10 senators, and Brooklyn and Queens, of course, have only the two of the state of New York. So how can we reform that 
you know, within this constitutional framework, that would be the... Well, I think that as a first step, we have to try to win the races in January in yeah. Georgia. Uh, the, but Magali, I think that the Democratic Party or that the politics that young and insurgent groups are bringing into the Democratic Party uh, ha have to try to overcome the, the constrictions on American politics that have made the Democratic Party unpopular among large segments of working people. You know, I gr grew up in the 1930s and 40s. And I grew up in a neighborhood in Queens that was mainly immigrant, but Irish Americans, Jewish Americans, Italian Americans, they were pretty conservative and very attached to their churches. But I remember when Roosevelt died, the feelings on my street were of such grief, such deep grief, because Roosevelt who was a social democrat after all, or a democratic socialist, however you prefer. Roosevelt was beloved. He was beloved no matter that he didn't sort of sound the gongs of their church and their particular ethnic affiliation. He was beloved because he worried about little people. That was how they thought of it and they were right because the New Deal did do a lot for working people, poorer people in the United States. Uh, think, think about the New Deal's electrification of the country, about Woody Guthrie's songs, about roll on Columbia, roll on. The, we could do that again. We don't want more electrification because we are green now, but we could do it with broadband. We could bring the internet. You know, where, where I uh, live in upstate New York, there is no internet. I have my own, uh, Hut. My, my, my own, what, whatever you call it. Hut. So there's so much that w we could do as a society that would be meaningful in the lives of working people. Healthcare is probably the most important, but we, we also have to develop reforms in education, which make it less oligarchical, less aristocratic, less a duplication of the hierarchy that already exists in the country. We have to have childcare for everybody. What about that? I mean, no, no countries have that. We should have that. We want women, no matter how poor, we want them all to go to work. And we don't want to take care of their children. What kind of craziness is that for a society? So let's develop a party that knows about and speaks to the urgent needs of the majority of people who are below the one percenters, 10 percenters. I think that would, that would make the Democratic Party a popular party. We'd win elections, but we would have to ignore Wall Street. The Democratic Party now is tied to Wall Street. What kind? That's not a working people's party. It can't be a working people's party. I would like to turn it to the other thing to see also to the to our audience, our invisible audience. I mean, I I think when I arrived to this country, I remember uh, also the funeral of LBJ. That really was moving people parked 
uh, on the embankment of the railroad that took him back to Washington from Texas, all, you know, all along the rails. And uh, people knew what, he, it was mainly black people, people who knew that he had passed the Voting Rights Act and that he knew it was going to lose the South for the Democrats. But uh, it was very impressive. I had never seen that. And so we should also remember that. I think I should turn it to, uh, to you, Sarah Jane, um, from abroad, you can see us that way, and to Lori, who can tell us um, much closer if the Democratic Party has a chance of transforming itself through the vote. If it has a chance of transforming itself, I'm not sure about that, but I think it has to. And I think um, a lot of work needs to be done locally because we don't have control in a lot of states and the governorships. And I really, frankly, one of the things that disappoints me is the elitism that exists in the party. And people want to feel like it everything that Francis said, that it's about their lives. Not that it's about somebody else's life far away, that there's a government that cares about them. I get so disappointed in listening to people who think they're more progressive, more intelligent, blah, 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 whatever, speak to others in a way that they don't realize is not pulling them in, but pushing them away. Um, Actually, I just want to address the question about surprise of the election. I'm surprised Trump didn't win, to be very honest with you. <laughs> because, <Really? laughs> because I listen to both sides of the rhetoric and try and struggle within some of the platforms, the Democratic Party, myself and the Progressive Caucus, trying to get some things pushed in that were not successful. Um, just such as the militarization of the police, things like that. I don't want to go into that, but it seems to me that this is a party that needs to re not just have a makeover. It needs to be rebuilt at the state level. And I think we need um, to make way for new young, young is relative, right? <laughs> new young leaders to come in and push the issues forward, really from more of a community organizing standpoint of getting people organized at the local level around the issues they care about, rather than this is what you care about, this top-down method um, that builds distance between people. This is a long-term strategy. I'm here for the long haul anyway. Um, <laughs> but I'm thinking we, it can't just be this national party. It has to happen locally. Well, but Lori, um, why don't Jump you in. take it on? Because we tried very hard in Turn Pennsylvania Blue to do exactly that. And I must say that we failed miserably. I mean, Lori, to you. I, I do think in, in the immediate sense of this election, there needs to be that kind of what they call an autopsy of what happened because there, the coattails of the Biden uh, victory were not that long. And that was, that was probably somewhat surprising. I think some people might have thought the opposite might have happened, as Sarah Jean just mentioned, that Trump might have won, but the Democrats might have taken the Senate, or they might have done much better at the state level, and they didn't. So that, I'm, you know, I don't have an answer or an analysis of that, but what I do want to say is, first of all, the, the Democratic Party is not a party in the sense of like the Bolshevik party was a party <laughs> or the, uh, you know, or, or, or the Italian communist party was a party. They're, they're, not, they're not really a party like that. There are, they are, the party itself is a sort of loose collection of a lot of different kinds of groupings, both within the electorate and institutionally. The DNC is just a, the national uh, sort of coordinating body. They, they are involved in presidential elections. They have a platform. Um, they um, have a convention and so forth. But the party structure has state parties. They're local parties. They're um, you know local elections, state elections, where where it's not like it's tightly controlled from the top. Absolutely. And and so to the extent that it's really you know at the at, at the subnational level, it's a kind of institutional vehicle for getting on the ballot. It's open. 
it's fairly open. And I think one of the interesting things that has happened in recent years, very recent years, with the election of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, for example, um, and other progressives, self-professed sort of movement style progressives, young people who, who are in DSA or who are active in social movements and social causes turning to electoral politics is that we, we are seeing the result of that. And it's happened on a small level, but it's significant. And the result is if you believe Bernie Sanders, um, you know, he said if, if Biden got elected, he'd be the most progressive president since FDR based on the positions that he's taken on the on $15 uh, uh, an hour wage, for example, on police reform, on the issues of race that have been put forward. He's now come out and said in his, uh, you know, his first executive orders is going to reverse 100 or so environmental regulations or what that, that, that Trump turned back on climate change. Now, I don't want to say what he's going to do, I, I, because that's another issue. That's another place where we all can get disappointed. But I do want to say that I do want to recognize the significance of the election of, of progressive uh, political young people, especially um, using the Democratic Party uh, that way. And that is a dynamic process between people getting elected, trying to struggle within the institutions of government, whether it's the Congress or the state legislatures, and trying to move forward legislation that addresses these issues and the constituencies that they build for electoral politics through that process. It's a dynamic back and forth process. So in terms of, you know, how do you reform the party? I think it's a mistake to think that what you have to take on is some monolithic, you know, organization that is excluding progressives, for example, or is excluding other people or is talking or is talking down uh, to, to people as Sarah Jean was, you know, mentioning that idea as well. And, you know, I think um, that, that, that can be a concern because of the turn away that Francis, Francis talked about, the turn away of the Democratic Party from the working class. And Bill Clinton's uh, election really signified this. And you saw those policies that were harmful to um, organized labor, for example, the free trade policies that became the basis, you know, where Trump went fishing for voters. Uh, who had been traditionally Democratic voters. Um, that was what was significant about Trump. Trump is not an ideological conservative or committed to the Republican Party or you know, seeing himself in the long line of politicians dating back to Lincoln. That's not who Trump is. He went fishing for, for, for disaffected people, especially in the Midwest who are angry at the Democratic Party angry at those free, free trade agreements, angry at the failure to get labor law reform in all these years. You know, organized labor is bleeding members for decades now. And that has really sort of set adrift a population that became um, susceptible to the populism of Donald Trump, to the racism of Donald Trump. Um, so I, I do wanna just note that about, you know, thinking about how you reform um, how you reform the party, that, it, that the institutional structure needs to be considered. Um, for example, I would say that any effort to try to organize a third party at the national level is a fool's errand. But at the local level, it's entirely possible. I mean, many, many local um, uh, communities, municipalities, cities, towns um, have nonpartisan elections to begin with. You can, you can organize um, and try to channel energy where it is at, a, at the local level if there is no kind of democratic party to join. If it's much more open there. Um, and those efforts can bubble up into the election of politicians, I would say though within, at the national level, within the democratic party and the Republican party because those parties institutionally organize the federal government. They, they control the way the federal government, the Congress works. And it's just, to my mind, not uh, a wise approach to try to, um, you know, in a sense, address the failings of the Democratic Party and the failings of the Republican Party with a party, a third party effort. 
um, that would, would actually gain power at the national level. I know a lot of people don't necessarily agree with that on the left, but I, I, I do think that's important to pay attention to. If I may add one thing, you know, it, it always, I totally agree with you, but the problem, Lori, is that we failed. Turn Pennsylvania blue was that. And I must say for those who are hearing that it was, we had to canvas and contact voters by phone, which is an absolutely losing proposition. And I think it lost us a lot of votes. Uh, we were obsessed with COVID and we should have gone to knock door, and door, door to door with a mask and at six feet distance, but we didn't. Now, um, the fact is that uh, when we, um, we decided to go with Turn Pennsylvania Blue and it didn't work, that was a really important thing. You know, of course, uh, because uh, the districts were corrected, you know, the gerrymandering, uh, which I have to explain apparently to those who are abroad, the gerrymandering is a partisan redistricting for to favor your own party, you know, instead of doing a redistricting that takes care of the population and of its representation, you do a redistricting that takes care of the population of your own party. And both parties do it, but the Republicans have understood that in order to do it more, they have to control state legislatures. And so that's what we wanted to correct and we did not manage to. You know, uh, the congressional districts were uh, also reformed by court mandate in Pennsylvania, but not the state legislatures. And the state legislatures are going to control the next districts. That's why I see local politics as very, very difficult. In, Local politics, it's something that you can both explain to me. Local politics in Philadelphia exist. They are part of a corrupt machine, but not only. I'm very friendly with a woman who is totally part of the machine. She has always been ward leader in one of the worst wards of the city in terms of drugs and poverty, the 33rd, where I've done four electoral campaigns. She's a fantastic ward leader. She gets all sorts of things for her ward, not as a ward leader, but as the Community Development Corporation chair, okay? But she's both things. And however, she doesn't translate all that politically. It remains at a local level where she's trying to improve her ward and her big fight is drugs, really. But um, the city doesn't do anything to help her. To give you an example, there was an encampment of homeless addicts on the parkway. And the city had only one goal was to remove them. And it kept offering them shelter. And some of them accepted it finally to get some, some houses. There is an encampment in Kensington, which is the ward I'm talking about, and nobody does anything. Uh, and of course, because the neighbors are poor and they don't count, and that's what they say. You know, they removed uh, these extremely, um, problematic population from the rich parts, but not from here. And so we take our kids to school. Well, we did take our kids, we used to take our kids to school in the middle of this situation. But in any case, I think that the Democratic Party in Philadelphia has a presence and it may be so in other places, but it's not a political presence. Well, let me just mention two, a couple things to that. I mean, first of all, like I said, I think it's worthwhile to do that kind of autopsy of what happened, what actually happened in Pennsylvania, um, you know, the activists who were trying to turn Pennsylvania blue, what actually happened for, you know, to the extent that the coronavirus issue and the pandemic um, affected the get out the vote uh, effort that is very important at the local level and the state level, the retail politics at that level, very important because the national vote uh, is, is maybe organized by other things about the, you know, the, 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 the energy to try to uh, get rid of Trump. And you can see that in terms of um, the early voting that, that went on. I mean, people made up their mind, they knew what they wanted to do in the presidential election. The local state and local people look at these things differentially. They look at, you know, they look at their own 
representative. Maybe the representative is, is a Republican who has done well in the district and they want to reelect that person. I and mean, that's what we kind of saw in Maine. Maine went for Biden. Maine went, also went for Susan Collins. There was a reason for that. And we have to understand what that is. But my point here is that um, uh, you know, focusing on state and local politics, sometimes the variables are different in terms of um, understanding what happened. And I think the, the get out the vote effort that you were talking about, Magali, I know you've also been involved in, is, is probably even more important at the state and local level. And maybe that was hampered by coronavirus and pandemic. And the, second, the second piece to that that's related is the use of technology in elections. And I was struck by, um, again, an interview with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez pushing back on this idea or this sort of, you know, uh, imminent kind of rift within the Democratic Party from the moderates and the progressives. Like you said, Magali, don't use the language, defund the police. We like, can't embrace those lefty um, uh, policy issues. We're going to lose. And her answer to that was that, you know, everybody who embrace, I think except for one who embrace Medicare for all won, and that her uh, knowledge and, and experience now in turning out voters through the use of social media, through targeting, through all these kind of technologies that have been on the scene for a little while, but seem to be increasingly important, each more important each election can be playing a role. We don't know yet the extent to which the Latino vote for Trump was influenced by the you know kind of messaging to Latinos that like the disinformation that was targeted to Latinos on Facebook that went under the radar because I don't know maybe Facebook doesn't have people who speak Spanish so they didn't know how to how to take it down but that appears to be you know something that happened so this is another um, thing that we don't know enough about is the extent to which the messaging the use of social media and the dirty tricks and disinformation that went on. We don't know how much of that. It, it, it doesn't, you know, the, the sort of crude voter suppression stuff uh, did not seem to be the issue, like, you know, physical mobs sort of blocking people from voting. But the information flows, the messaging, the, you know, the lies, the efforts to try to um, uh, keep people home, for example. Um, we don't know yet how effective that was. So I would say to you, again, like, you know, to your point about why did Pennsylvania not go blue, even though maybe it voted for Biden by some margin, maybe 100,000 votes, which is not nothing. Um, what, how do we explain that? I think we have to look at these issues better to get a better understanding of what actually happened on the ground. I want to say one thing that I know happened. I, you know that I'm involved with the Latino voters, there is no such thing as Latino vote, and but I'm involved with the Hispanic voters. And um, I was helping Hazleton, which is an interesting place, but I won't go in it here. It's 70% Dominican. And finally, I didn't even go there. I don't have a car anymore, it's very far. But finally, uh, the young organizer, who's a brilliant organizing genius, called me and says, Mayali, they came out and they voted for Trump. You know why? I said, no. Well, a lot of them voted for Trump. I said, I can't believe it. I have these names, you know. A lot of them voted for Trump. You know why? Because Trump was so kind. He sent them this $1,200 check. And so Josh would say, he did not send them. It's my money. It's your money. No, no, no. He signed the check. So, you know, this Elmer Gantry or whatever he is, he was very clever. Remember that he kept them waiting four or five weeks because he wanted the freaking signature on the check? Well, that's what they kept saying. I, I got the $1,200, I gave them immediately away, but I got them right in my bank account. People who got checks, got checks signed by Trump. And I they, think that letter meant a lot to people that letter that came, I, I got the check, check with the letter, but a letter in Spanish, I got a letter in Spanish. So I think for p some people that meant something and it had his, yeah. you know, big felt signature on it. I mean, he's a showman, he knows that. And we underestimate, I think sometimes those things that seem trivial to us because it's ridiculous, sorry. But, but they because matter. Because it's fake. Exactly. Exactly. 
<laughs> yeah, I didn't see the letter, but do we have questions, Kyle? You were going to clear the questions and I can go there and find them. Jason Teal raises this question. He says, fascist systems still repress humanity in the United States and everywhere. There is still deprivation, modern slavery in our prison systems and discrimination within every community. Many American liberals have voiced that they are glad that we can now go back to ignoring politics in light of Trump's defeat in the recent election. I feel this is a dangerous and maladaptive mentality. How must we combat this? This is from Jason Teal. We are combating that, aren't we? That's what we're trying to do. We, the, the, the argument that we have to uh, stay engaged in politics, that we have to push Biden and push him and push him on a range of issues, very importantly, healthcare, the Green New Deal. And this is an argument for sustaining the activism of the last few years uh, and pushing it forward, enlarging it. Uh, well, we have to try. And that's what the movements are doing. That's what Black Lives Matter uh, is doing. And that's what all the uh, Justice Democrats uh, move on. Uh, the, the Women's March, they're all of them that are trying to sustain Same the politicization way. of the last few years. And I think that can be done. If it is not done, if that does not succeed, if everybody really does go back to their comfort zone and their couch, then we're in a lot of trouble. Lori and Sarah Jean, would you like to add to that? Totally agree uh, with what Francis is laying out. And I, uh, you know, I've known Francis for a very long time. She was my teacher many, many years ago. And uh, I, I used to think, you know, well, it, it must have been exciting, you know, to be part of the movements of the 60s. What does it feel like when you're in a movement era? What does it mean? And I, I don't know if that's what it feels like now, Francis. Are we are we in that movement era? Is we that going to help carry it? The movement era. You can see it all around you. This is a movement moment, and you know it is so exhilarating to be in the middle of a movement and to be active. It is so satisfying. You have friends. You feel as though you're making an impact on your community, on your country, on your world. And it's great, go out and do it because you're going to enjoy it. And you're going to be able to tell your children and your grandchildren about it and be very proud of your life. Sarah Jean, what do you think? Well, listening to Francis, I feel like I'm part of a movement moment right now. So <laughs> I, I appreciate, I really appreciate your, you. your energy still so positive about that. I actually feel we, I also feel the same way. We are in a movement moment, but whether we take the moment to really push forward or not is really up to us. I, and how we deal with this, you know, school to prison pipeline, I think starts with ordinary people as well. I mean, it's got to happen at every level. So I feel, I feel hopeful about the future, but only if we are willing to take on the responsibility of acting and not do what many people, excuse me, I felt that after Barack Obama was elected, I feel like, oh, whew, we got him elected, we're done, we're, we can, okay, we're good now. Um, that was my experience in, in, in the 2008 election. A lot of people felt like I worked hard the past year, we got a black man in the office, we're all good now, goodbye. We can't do that. I think this is just a step. This is not an end. Some of us are teachers or were teachers in my case. And I think how we talk to our students about activism and movement work is kind of important. I've always tried to convey to my students how joyous working in the movement really is, how much pleasure I get out of my movement work, what great friends I have, 
a sense of accomplishment that I have. And I think that that's a contribution that we can make as teachers, as people who are looked up to by young people who don't know. They don't know. They haven't, they haven't been in the, in the mix uh, to find out. So we ha that, that should be uh, something we can do. We can tell them how, how much this movement activism added to our lives. Of course, it, I'm, I, is, are there other questions, Kyle? No, but I'd like to invite the um, attendees to raise questions, and I, I could raise them forward. Um, I, I wanted to, maybe as I'm speaking, I could raise this issue. Um, at our university, when the Black Lives Matter movement had really amplified in the United States, one of our students named Sarah Todd, she organized a Black Lives Matter movement rally, a march. And there were about 3,500 people, many Temple University students, but a lot of other students in Tokyo. In, in Tokyo. And what was interesting about it is, of course, many of these are American students. We have students at TJ from about 50 countries. And many of our students of color, you know, they had experienced these issues and they were very much focused on American political issues. There was a question among some Japanese students about how do you transpose that and apply it to Japan, which has a whole different set of issues with minorities and discrimination, and very significant and historically very profound. So how can you make that cultural translation? And maybe I could raise this to you, Sarah Jean, about, you know, how do we make that from, a, from abroad? You know, how do people engage in politics when they have their own local issues to address? That's, that's a great question, Kyle. And I guess I'm Something it's important to realize too, even in a country like Japan, there's a Black Lives Matter Tokai Central Japan raising up and they're talking about these questions in these other areas of Japan. Um, and one thing I've talked about with the Central Japan people is about how you don't have to focus on George Floyd. There's a George Floyd in every community. And I even, uh, you know, there's cases around people in Japan that have been Buraku people, other minority people that have been, you know, in illegal detention for a long time. There is a George Floyd everywhere. There is an oppressed person everywhere. You can, but people don't necessarily know about it. And that's what I've been trying to do through my work in school and out of, out of Temple and out of Sophia we can look at what's happening outside, but we can also look what's happening immediately around here because there are people oppressed around us. And sometimes, again, going back to what Francis said, as an instructor, as a teacher, as an educator, there's a great opportunity just to open some windows and doors for students to actually introduce what are, like really what's going on because folk, Focusing on what's going overseas, there's always the danger of people just sitting back saying, everything is good here, thank God. You know, we don't have violence in, well, nobody has violence in the US uh, that's not at war, or, you know, there aren't guns, you know, we have health care. oh, everything's great here. Okay, everything's so good, but let's look at those who are oppressed. Let's look at, um, I have some students in my Sophia class focusing on the Ainu, one of the indigenous groups, in Japan, and um, and I see one of my students is actually here. <laughs> Hello, um, um, you know. Let's think about it in a more critical way, rather than thinking it's not as bad as, say, the Navajos that are suffering under COVID nineteen. What are their issues? There's a lot we can do to open to start peeling back some of those layers that they can then run with. I think that we fall into a trap, not just in Japan, of saying, well, the culture is different, the situation is different, nothing translates. Fine, there's somebody oppressed everywhere. Help people understand the people that are forgotten or not covered in the media, whether it's the homeless, the orphans in Japan, which get no coverage. There are people 
nearby in your neighborhood. So if you can focus that, I think then students or adults, it doesn't matter, can connect to that. Um, but I'm excited to see the Black Lives Matter expanding in local areas in Japan, that it's, it's starting amazing. to have some resonance slowly. Well, it has expanded all over the world, but it's not only a question of fighting for the oppressed and, and the incarcerated, it's also a question that even in voting systems that work much better than the United States, which is about all of them, uh, in my humble perspective, all of them are better voting systems than this exemplary democracy. Uh, there, the, the point that France has made about the conflict between the capitalist ruling class and the franchise, let's call it that way, okay? They, they didn't know what hit them when the franchise was expanded. And they have, according to Daniel Ziblatt, they have been struggling against it ever since, you know? But here, with more success than elsewhere, the vote suppression in the United States and the domination of a minority party are unreplicated, but this is to say that you also have issues of representation. You know, they're not as dramatic or not fraught with pain, but if you are going to work on the pain that is suffered, then maybe you should also work on the means by which you can attack it in everywhere. The, you know, the movements have little... I want to ask a question because I'm thinking, do you, I recognize that Biden has, thanks to Bernie and to the power that he brought to the table, Biden has a very progressive agenda. But is he going to be able to explain to people why he does nothing? Because they are already preparing to obstruct even his cabinet appointments. You know, it's already said that just let him try to, uh, to appoint Elizabeth Warren and he'll see. So what can he do? Be a constantly uh, talking, have fireside chats. What do you think, Francis? I think that uh, it shouldn't be left, the explanation shouldn't be left to Biden. Right. Because Biden uh, is too nice. Uh, he's too much the gentleman. He believes in everybody getting along. And the Republican Party has shown clearly that it's not in the business of getting along. So I think it, a, a lot will depend on the new groups that have formed and come forward to identify the obstructionists, to demonstrate against the obstructionists, to call, call them names, to say what they're doing and to say it as loudly as possible. And there are a lot of these groups that are ready to do that. Uh, you know, from Planned Parenthood to Emily's List to uh, the NAA to- Who's democracy uh, also. Yeah, to Justice Democrats to, what's the name of Reverend Barber's group? The People's- The People's Campaign. The People's Campaign. Everybody should be uh, making it clear that the Democrat, that the Republicans are standing in the way of policies that are desperately needed, desperately needed. We have to stop the deaths. We have to stop the deaths and we have to make sure that people have food and we have to make sure that people are not evicted. You know, in the United States right now, we are right on the cusp of a massive crisis in housing because people do not have the money to pay the rent. What is gonna happen? The, well, what should happen is that every state government and, and the federal government should institute a moratorium on evictions. That's, to me, that's obvious, but it won't happen by itself and it won't happen. It won't be something that Biden will take the initiative on unless he is pushed. So our job or the job of the left, the job of the activists is to push Biden. Uh, may I add something strange? I, I don't know if the people who are in the audience know what the Lincoln Project is, 
but it's a group of uh, former Republican strategists who have become independent. And um, I'm sure they had money, but they started with some incredibly brutal ads against Trump and they continued, they were very good. And I, um, I was so impressed with their ads that I sent them money. So I'm always constantly invited to the town hall. And they were saying, Mike Madrid, the pollster, who's better than the ones we had, uh, he was saying the defense of democracy must be fierce. It cannot be gentle. And he really surprised me by saying the two big issues in the United States right now, and they concentrate on the, um, on the pandemic, they appear very illuminated, but they are economic inequality and demographic transition. And that's what we must explain to people, what we must correct, what we must fight. This is a Republican talking, you know, a Republican poster and strategist. The fact is that their ads for those who want to see something different, go to the Lincoln Project site and look at the ads they put, um, they, they aired everywhere. But so we have certain allies who also know technically what they're doing, Gloria. It's, uh, it's amazing. They put them every place and you would see this ad like morning in America, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, not morning. And more, at the end, it says, let's make it a morning. But, uh, you know, the Democrats didn't do anything like it. Nothing. You know, it came from these old Republicans. <laughs> so, it, but anyhow, that was a comment about <clears throat> a strategy of communication. I don't know that they would communicate about um, moratorium on evictions, but they talked about it. I, I was very surprised that there are people who have left the birth of the Republican Party and quite changed their their songs. Some of them may have. I, I don't know the degree to which I, I actually trust that they've yeah. had their come to Jesus moment, be, you know, and I, I would worry about them turning that same sort of viciousness, you know, against the left in the Democratic Party as a way of, you know, keeping back the kind of big reforms that we need, but I take your point. I mean, that it was effective and maybe the dem to the extent that the Democrats didn't kind of reach that level of personal, uh, you know, demonization of Trump and the, and the viciousness really of some of those ads, they may have felt, why do we need to do it? The Lincoln Project is doing it for us. And the Lincoln Project did raise millions of dollars from Democrats. So, <laughs> so that's, you know, that's an interesting point there, but, um, uh, I, I think this issue of keeping people activated um, is is the right one, and and as a, again, I I think we're seeing some of it bleeding through to what's actually happening, and I I think those those Congress people um, who have gotten elected in in the 2018 and 2020 elections um, who keep pushing the the progressive agenda you know, need need to know that the support is is there behind them, even if it's not your district, um, because they could be facing now this kind of reorientation to the center and the, the narrative that we have to govern there from the center. That That's what we're going to see how that shakes out, what happens in the next several months, even in terms of who, who Biden, Biden appoints or attempts to appoint uh, to run the agencies. Um, I think given the American system, there are so many points of contact, if you will. There's so many places where leverage can be um, uh, attempted at and that, that sometimes we're blocked. We're blocked in the Senate right now. We're not necessarily blocked in a state that has um, you know, democratic legislature and a democratic uh, governor and would be willing to adopt election reform like New Jersey did a few years ago with with uh, you know Phil Murphy and the legislature there uh, it sort of vo vaulted New Jersey from being a state that wasn't that didn't really have um, a lot of early voting mail voting you know th it's still like three weeks you have to uh, before election day you have to register but but changing those rules over time can change the electorate and make it easier to mobilize 
those um, those new populations into the electorate, and you can change the politics that way. So even if we're blocked at the Senate, look around at all the other places where um, the pressure can be effective and, and changing the rules that change the institutional arrangements around the elections, for example, mm -hmm. election policy. You know, look at that, look at the turnout in the states. You're gonna see at the top, the states that have some of the most pro-voter uh, rules in place, election day registration, automatic registration, um, early voting, online voter registration, um, you know, efforts to restore the vote to people who have felony convictions in states that have those kinds of rules. It's a little more of the small board politics, but you know, that again, that analysis of where the leverage can be brought is important to understand because there's so much work to do. So again, to the question, how do you keep active? There's so much work to do um, everywhere that uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, the activi activism really can continue. Anybody wants to add something to this? Because I, I'm, I don't think that Biden, what I was saying is that I don't think either that Biden can defend himself. I think that in order to push the most progressive parts of his agenda and to really demonstrate that against those that block it, uh, it, it cannot be him, it won't be him. So I, I agree, I wanted you to hear that. Unfortunately, it's difficult to connect the two things. I mean, we have here, for instance, very effective groups uh, who have been effective electorally, like Reclaim Philadelphia, but they didn't want much of a part, uh, not the guy they elected um, as a state representative. He was, you know, he had played the game and he was going to play the game, but the group itself was so involved with the statue of Columbus that he couldn't do anything else. They didn't, you know, they voted only for their state representatives. They didn't vote at the top. They refused to vote for Biden. So of course there are not very many, but um, the, it's a group that really does not connect to the stable black community and that uh, is dangerous. They, they had a lot of, uh, you know, they follow black youth when black youth demonstrate, but they never go to a black church to talk to older people. And do you have any more questions, Kyle? Well, I have a more broad reaching question for all the panelists. Lori, when you were working up the abstract for this webinar, one of the issues you raised was, will there be a, a version of Trumpism after Trump? And so where do you think the Republican Party and American politics goes following this election? I suppose Trump is going to move his show down the road and start a MAGA TV network to compete with Fox News. He's talked about even running again in 2024. Be but, will, but will the movement of Trumpism outlive Trump? Will there be a, a new Trump rising? Um, how do you see the future of Republican politics and the movement that, that uh, brought Trump to power? Yes, I, I, I think, you know, the Trump, we can connect Trumpism to um, previous movements in the United States. I mean, sometimes it's the same people, um, but, but the tradition of uh, so this kind of what people call right wing populism um, has been uh, something we've seen before. Um, and so trying to understand what the roots of that are, I mean, to the extent that the Democratic Party, as Francis was advocating and, and talking about um, becoming a party that actually solves or attempts to solve people's problems who are living in rural communities, the people who became susceptible to these appeals of po populist appeals. Um, you know, pop populism has a kind of, uh, you know, broad uh, uh, framework for, for engaging people, even though it's authoritarian. I mean, it, it also engages people, be, authoritarian engages them, is populism. I mean, it's, there's a mass base for populism. So, you know, understanding what the problems are for people who became susceptible to the kinds of appeals that Trump made is very, very important. And, and we are imperiled if, if, uh, if the Democratic Party, for example, doesn't take that very, very seriously and try to understand it. So I do think that what we're calling Trumpism, we could have called it populism, we could have 
um, called it the silent majority in the 1970s. Um, that, that base um, needs to, we need to pay attention to some of the problems there. And we need to look for ways in which um, a new majority can be fashioned. So having said that, I don't want to minimize what I think is absolutely central to it, which is race and racism. And I don't mean to say we can simply talk people sometimes out of their racism, race the racism that's completely unacceptable. So, so I don't mean to, you know, kind of have a Pollyanna view of what could happen. But I do think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to to address the problems of constituencies that could be part of a broader progressive coalition in the United States um, through through policy. I, as for Trump, who knows? He, as everybody describes him as a person of instinct, he's saying now what he's saying. Um, I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means if he has his own uh, his own media company or something, and you know tries to keep uh, a role for himself in uh, influencing this base of 72 million Americans who voted for him, many for the second time. Um, whether he tries to keep them active and sort of troublemaking within the, the normal two-party politics that we have, the political system that we have, I don't know. This is a bit un, un, unpredictable what he will do. He has certainly been unpredictable to all the political scientists here who yeah. have, uh, you know, tried to study and predict um, uh, what happens in electoral politics. He's a sort of unlikely character given his, um, you know, abysmal record as a, uh, a businessman and the fraud that he, that he actually is. Um, people didn't understand that the appeal he had by being on television for 12 years because none of us watched The Apprentice. None of us understood. The, the, the image he had created for himself before he ran for president. So I don't know what to say about you know, Trump and his role, but Trumpism as a force, I do think will continue to some degree. And you know, it'll be important to try to put, put a lid on some of the worst aspects of that movement. Francis. Well, look, yeah. this is a country that harbors the Ku Klux Klan. It's a country that harbored the brown shirts in the 1930s. Uh, it's a country that harbored the militias, the patriots, all of the groups of the last 20 years who killed children. I mean, this, and so a, there's a kind of native fascism in the United States which thrives because we are uh, of, of the racism that also is part of our political culture. We have to expect that the experience of Trump's presidency of this clown and his uh, blustering, bullying rhetoric, that that, that experience gave a shot in the arm to our native fascism. We're going to have to live with a powerful fascist constituency that will at certain moments acquire the contours of a movement, of a protest movement. And so we're gonna to have to learn how to override that movement. I am not one of these people that thinks that you can sort of get close to them, feel their pulse, pity, their, pity them for their aches and pains and the way their mother didn't treat them right. No, we have to override them. We have to be more than them, many more than them. We have to be louder than them and we have to be confident in a way that they can't be because they're wrong. They're morally wrong. So, but we're gonna, we're gonna have to deal with them because they're here now and they're stronger than before. And they're armed, which is something that probably they wouldn't be elsewhere. They're armed. Uh, actually, one thing that protects us, as my son pointed out, is that we haven't seen them be very adventurous physically or very sport, you know, 
very oriented to what towards what a freedom warrior would do. They go everywhere by car. They don't take two steps. They're enormously overweight. I mean, um, there are certain things about American fascism that are less disquieting than it could be elsewhere. But uh, uh, one thing these people don't have, and I speak as an Italian, is that it's not fascism Italian style. Uh, fascism, in Italy came from socialism and had an agenda and put together something that was important that in fact was uh, inspired the Swedish Swedish corporatism. But these guys only want to fill their pockets. And for those who don't know, Trump is asking donations from the 72 million people. Imagine that if each of those voters gives him $10, he's going to have $720 million and he'll be able to pay $427 million to the bankers that he owes. <laughs> but, you know, this is important to remember, and Francis also has taught us, there is an American nativism that is in the process of being superseded by demographic transition. Now, we must not assume that the uh, people who are growing the fastest, the Hispanics, are progressive because they are not. You know, there is a, a clear third that uh, declares itself Republican and is Republican and closes the door behind themselves when they become citizens and they don't want anything to do with the other immigrants. You know, what we're talking about constitutes a reason for not ever giving support to the sort of idea that let bygones be bygones, let's leave all of these uh, misdeeds in the past, let's move, look forward. No, we have to name the crimes and prosecute them to the extent that we're able to do that. I agree so, with you 100% how... there, hmm. Francis, because I really hmm. worry that we do that at our own peril in the few years time that'll all come back to bite us. We have to stick to a moral core values of what we stand for and fight for that. I'm not saying be horrible like the people we dislike, but use our power in a very productive way to build a more progressive base. But one, I just want to say one thing I am concerned about is how can I say this? Just how the loss of legitimacy, maybe in many people's eyes due to the, whether it's fa false information or just this whole process or just this presidency, that's something I really concern about the legacy on young people, which is why I also think we have to take a responsibility to act because that can really, again, we ignore it at our own peril. I think we have to face it. If, if I could speak on onto that, I think obviously it's, it's really important that the Democratic Party and people who have progressive ideals have as their North Star, their underlying moral values and the political commitments that align with that. But how can we address this political moment effectively if we're not able to communicate with the people who brought Trump to power. Um, Magali and Francis, you're both, I'm sure, friends with um, Arlie Hochschild. And Arlie wrote a book called Strangers in Their Own Land. That book was, I guess, more of a ethnographic research of, of living amongst people that uh, this was the Tea Party that rose to later deliver Trump to the White House. And that work is really based upon, in her discussion of that work, is a, is a real kind of a deep empathy to try to understand what motivates people. Uh, the economist Tyler Cowen has a blog site called um, Marginal Revolution. And in that, he has a 12 principles of life. And one of them is learn how to learn from those who offend you. So what is there to learn from the Trump movement? both for progressive politics, but also for, for the future of being able to have a democratic party that's able to reach out to those people that they have lost in the last decade. I'm really 
not sympathetic with the idea that we should reach out to those people, that we should try to feel their pain, that we should, that empathy is the solution to the pro, the growing problem of domestic fascism. I think the solution rather is the strengthening of American democratic socialism, of our own beliefs and our own programs and our own political uh, ranks. That's the solution. The, what, uh, I mean, I, I really like Arlie. She's a, <laughs> She, she does good work, but I, the, I think I disagree totally with the political message of the book, which, it, which is a message about empathy and understanding and pity and sympathy. No, no pity and sympathy and empathy for people who endorse ripping children away from their parents from people who endorse, endorse ruining the lives of young black men by throwing them in prison, for people who endorse the destruction of other people. No, we have to strengthen our own ranks and strengthen our own vision of solutions to the point where we are attractive to them. And if a lot of them will never be attracted to us, but that's okay too. I wanted to say one thing, if I may. Um, at one point, I stopped reading Arlie's book because I was so irritated with the people with whom she has so much empathy. <laughs> These were people who had kept the best jo jobs for themselves, had not given one of those good paying jobs to blacks, so that perhaps some of those blacks had to struggle to go to school and now had better jobs because that had happened already at the end of the 19th century you know, between those immigrants who kept their jobs and those who didn't have them, and so therefore had to educate their children. But, you know, um, uh, I was very irritated because these people cry for the destruction of their fishing streams and the destruction of their fields by the oil industry for which they worked and where they would have continued work and for which they would have kept blacks out. So, I, I don't know why we should feel so sorry for them. You had it, you don't have it anymore. So, but that's, uh, that was just my reaction to strangers in their own land. They are people who have forever been strangers in their own land because they happen to be black and to have been brought here in slavery. And we still consider that if they're black, they are not really American, they're something else. Well, I, I mean, I don't, I don't see that, but I'm, I have had it, myself because of my accent all the time doing political work people who tell me uh, I don't talk to foreigners like you well I'm American well you don't sound it so you know that's how welcoming this country is but I, I think that ultimately if you ask what there is to learn from Trumpism he was not going to make a movement but I think there's a lot to learn from Obama he did not make a movement of his 14 million volunteers. He did not reinforce the Democratic Party. He, in fact, he made the stupidest appointments. You know, he names Janet Napolitano at Homeland Security, and so we lose Arizona. And then he names Kathleen Sibelius, her name was, to, who was a very mediocre Secretary of Health, Education, and Western and, and Welfare, and so we lose Kansas. No leader of a party does that. He never thought, he, he goes into 2010 without having explained anything. And then he says, well, what a shellacking. We, you know, we kept losing uh, first the House, then the Senate, and he did not really leave a party behind him. So well, he exemplifies what's wrong with the Democratic Party. Absolutely. The ways in which the Democratic Party is, has, co-responsibility for the tragedy that has befallen the United States. And it really is a terrible thing what's become of uh, American democracy. We've lost a lot and we, we have to regain it, but we won't regain it through the strategies of the Democratic Party from about when 1970 to now. 
I, I agree. I was only talking about rhetoric. You know, I, I mean, I am totally for completely transforming the budgets of cities, but I think it's less dangerous to say, reform the budget of the city than to say defund the police because ultimately police jobs are working class jobs and they hit your guts for saying that you know and uh, the other day I, I attended a webinar and a woman who works on latino voters said that 60 percent of the border patrol are hispanics i didn't know so they don't want to abolish ice <laughs> absolutely not but so we have to say something else you know, uh, that's all I was talking about. Not I, I know we're we're almost out of time, but I, I just wanted because it's a little bit of a contrary view to Magali and, and what and Francis have said, I'll say it very quickly, that, which is just I endorse what they they, they say, but I, I think in a way it points to the problem that, that I would want to highlight, which is you know, the erosion of of the of bonds of community, the erosion of welfare state, the, the sense in the United States that you are all by yourself, you are on your own. And the fact that we have this sort of QAnon conspiracy that like a lot of people actually seem to believe this bizarre story and they're motivated to act speaks a little bit to the confusion that many, many people have. Again, I don't, I'm not saying excuse fascists or racists or anything like that. But I do think to answer Kyle's question, you know, I do think there's some part of this population that voted for Trump, that voted for it out of out of out of us being confused about what's happening in the world, the way the world works. They're angry, they're lashing out. They see Trump as sticking his finger in the eye of the people they hate, who they think are responsible. They don't know who's responsible. There's a certain amount of you know, confusion of living in this world when, you're, when you are trying to make ends meet and the factories have gone away and the kids have gone away and the, and the place looks like a mess and nobody's there. Um, there is something to that that I think we do need to pay attention to and that I would uh, stress, you know, I don't, I don't know that the, the Hochschild book kind of does this exactly, but that I that I think there is something to learn from the from those those voters um, that would be important to know about how we go forward in reforming the Democratic Party or pressing these progressive policy solutions. We have to give them income or jobs for one thing. I also think, Lori, that I was not saying. To all those people. Hey, I live in Pennsylvania. I was talking about those in Louisiana that she talks to. Mm. But um, there's another thing that we cannot really ignore, and that's uh, the drugs, the opioid epidemic. That is something that, unfortunately, uh, Sarah Jean, you're abroad, but that's something that connects the two places that are so much at odds, the country and the city. There are drugs mm -hmm. everywhere in this country weapons too, but drugs and people, uh, parents are devastated among those who voted for Trump by the effect, the effect of the opioid epidemics on their communities and their children. It hasn't been very, very cheap, the industry, the second wave of deindustrialization. It has really come very heavily and the lack of a safety net. Now the, they don't believe in COVID, well, they don't even have hospitals in rural areas. And uh, well, I, it's, I think that I don't know how to do it because I'm very old and I don't live there and I don't want to live there. I don't want to, to go out of Philadelphia. I don't want to see them. I don't want to see their signs. But um, you know, those who can certainly have to, to work there. Um, I'm sorry, I think Kyle, that we have almost come to an end, and I would like to ask uh, our speakers, Lori, has, um, can you summarize all the things you said and say goodbye? Thank everyone for this wonderful conversation, and uh, I, I thought it was a really robust discussion of the problems and what we need to do from here. So I, that's all I would say. And to move forward to build the left in the United States, because we need the policies that will solve the problems of the people who were susceptible to the Trumpian appeals. Sarah Jean. 
And I think we need to uh, really think long term about reforming structures that are based on our slave past and really think long term and not just think an election is an end point. And let's use the energy of the people that we brought, you know, for this election to do these things. Thank you. Thank you all, and thank you, Kyle, for having organized it, and to Sarah Jean, and, and to my dear Francis and Lori for being here. We should do a Zoom among ourselves. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for your time and uh, the really interesting discussion that we had today. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Okay. Bye bye, everyone. Let's bye stay bye. in touch. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. This is Temple University of Japan's ICAST through the Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. If you'd like more information and to see our previous archive of events, look to the ICAS website. And also, we have an archive on YouTube with previous events. Thanks for joining us today.